Welcome into the Husker 24-7 podcast. I'm Brian Christofferson. I'm joined by Michael Brunts, and uh, we've got a variety of topics to discuss um, here on this. Uh, it's a Wednesday as we're doing this. Uh, we were going to first start off football. People like talking about football in this state. I've I've learned growing up here, so that that's always a good place to go, don't you think? Let's do that. We're we're officially in the depths of the off season now, February and May. Those are your two real in the off season months. So, mm-hmm. um, I, I I struggle to feign mock outrage about topics um, during this this portion of the season. Um, the off season, but we can get into a few things. I think there's, there's a couple interesting discussions to be had here today. Yeah. Uh, well, well semi interesting, at least we can go for that. Let's not Low set bar. the bar. Let's not set it too high up there. Um, but, but we've had the hamster wheel spinning and have a few ideas. And one of them, um, is we we're going to talk about the guys who red shirted last year. Um, cause I'm going to do a story shortly. This is going to pair together. See, it complements yeah. each other. It's like complimentary football, um, of guys who red shirted in 23, who could be ready to roll in 24. The question mark, you always had a question mark after it to kind of save yourself. It's like in journalism, when you use the word seemingly or apparently as sort of an out outward to uh, mm-hmm. protect yourself a little bit. So we are going through the list a little brunch with guys who, these are guys who red shirted. Um, you, there, you could name off like 20 dudes who did not surpass four games last year, um, from that class who, who might intrigue. Um, let's go with the guys though, who are kind of at the top of our list. Um, I'm going to let you go first, put you on the spot a little bit. If you're to say one name from there, he redshirted last year, but you're like, man, I'm really interested in him for 24. Who, who would you say? Demetrius Bell. Okay is at the top of my list. Wide receiver. Um, didn't we never we never saw him last year. That's why he's somewhat intriguing to me. Um, you know, he he was not able to play last season um as more or less an academic red shirt, but a guy that was mentioned very sparingly, but when he was, he he was always mentioned as creating a lot of issues for Nebraska's first team defense. Mhm. And, you know, I I think when they talk about the young wide receiver group and kind of what the potential is there, you know, obviously Malachi Coleman, Jalen Lloyd, Jaden Doss, um, but Demetrius Bell kind of fits in that group too. And he's intriguing to me because we had heard that he's put on quite a bit of weight since he's been on campus. Like, I, I think he was listed at like 170, something like that, whenever he signed. I think they list him up like north of 190 now, isn't it? I I, I don't have the yeah. official roster in front of me, but he's put on like 20 pounds since he's been on campus. And I'm really intrigued to see what he can do. Like I, I, I think for as much as Nebraska under Matt Rule is willing to play young guys, I feel like he's a guy that all things being equal might have had a chance to get on the field last year. Yeah, yeah. Um... I feel like he might have even gained more than you're giving credit. Like it was like 30 to 35, according to Marcus Satterfield on the one press conference. Remember, it was like he he said he was like in the 150s, maybe when he got here. And then and now he's at a 190. But you're right. Um, Even before that. The murmurs we would hear suggested this guy can be something. And uh, it seems like he's. To been taking care of business uh, off the field with whatever needs to happen there to maybe give himself a shot this spring. So he's definitely going to be a name of intrigue. And I mean, he was a four star guy. If I, if I'm remembering offhand, right. And um, had some impressive schools that were at least kicking the tires or looking at him throughout the process. So yeah, that's a very good name. Yeah. I, I think he's a guy that, you know, probably, you know, if things were a little bit better in the classroom, probably would have had Mm -hmm. even more recruiting attention than he did. I mean, I I think Nebraska really felt like they were able to get kind of a late steal there um, in that class with what he brings. Yeah, Um, definitely a good way to start it off. Um, The one I'm going to mention for my first guy is uh, Jeremiah Charles. Um, This shouldn't surprise anybody. Um, 
if you kind of pay, if you're one of those Husker fans who pays attention to like every word that kind of pops up when coaches talk, Charles was one of those, probably the lead figure that like Garrett McGuire and Evan Cooper, like arm wrestle over. It seems like, um, just a, he's, he's that sort of talent. He kind of switched between both spots. He was at wide receiver. I think when he started, but even in September, last September, Evan Cooper was saying, I'm trying to steal him. Well, now he is listed as a defensive back and Cooper is really bullish on his traits. It's no surprise sort of when you think about how this staff recruits and how they look at, um, like track numbers and things of that nature. And Jeremiah Charles, um, busted off. What was it? A six, eight, seven or something like that in the 60 in his first uh, college meet. He was up there. Uh, Jalen Lloyd might've beat him by a few, maybe I'm listing Lloyd's time, but they're right there. And, um, Charles just has all those like sort of, uh, things that this staff looks for measurable wise. Um, athletic freak didn't play a lot of football in high school actually. Um, but I think is one this staff believed they had stolen, um, in the process. Of course he came in with Ishmael Smith Flores, same, same high school down there and all that stuff. So he'd be the, he'd be a guy I would definitely watch. You could name off like five DBs, um, that red shirted that are interesting. Like we could talk about Dwight Boodle. Um, they really liked how Boodle came on when he arrived. Um, you know, last year, and then he suffered the injury. But if he can get back from that, he's definitely someone this staff um, saw things in practice that were leading them to believe he's going to he's going to get out there. He did play a few snaps before the injury. So um, those DBs as a whole that red shirted are really interesting, but probably none more so to me than Jeremiah Charles. Does, does it concern you? I mean, Bryce Turner is a red shirt that's kind of in the same situation. Yes. But does it concern you when guys – kind of take a while to land at a spot you know like early on in a guy's career he's maybe a wide receiver maybe a defensive back like Mm -hmm. maybe the staff and the way they handle things is a little bit different but does that ever kind of give you a little bit of pause about where a guy fits in um maybe not right away it doesn't like if we're still having this conversation about a certain guy um like a year from now one Mm -hmm. one of these ones we're mentioning i think i might be a little bit because it it feels like at some point you definitely have to land somewhere or go both ways or whatever um but not right now um and it it seems like that it what do they have turner listed at let's look is he is he on with uh cooper now um oh yeah yeah, he's a defensive back as well. I mean, you've got DeAndre Barnes is another one who's listed as a defensive back who redshirted, um, who is an athlete who could play either. Um, so I, I think this is the spring, though, where you'd like to see some of those guys settle in. Um, but Jeremiah Charles, I understand why there's been kind of a back and forth on him because he just had such limited football background, first of all. And also, this is just the way the staff's going to be with certain guys that are like wide receiver slash DB hybrids in high school. They're going to get them here. Then they're going to just see. I think he like he maybe maximizes a little bit more at this spot than that spot. Um, but it's going to take maybe that first year to kind of um, dissect that and figure it out. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, I the defensive back group is interesting because they had such a large group last year they redshirted most of those guys. Um, They signed another big group this year. And I mean, I know some of those guys are going to, you know, grow into linebackers or edge rushers or whatever, but I mean, it feels like that redshirt group guys in that crew are going to have to start showing some upward progress, you know, like I, I think there's a very high percentage that guys could get, kind of just caught up in the wash because there's just so many guys at that spot. And I, I think kind of seeing how those particular red shirts come out of uh, winter conditioning and kind of how they perform during spring, I think is going to be really interesting to follow because I just can't imagine that that group is going to go through the spring, go through the summer completely intact as it is. Yeah, I, I agree with you. The good news for them is that they play like 20 to 25 guys on defense. The bad news for them is that 
there are like 20 to 25 guys in that room. It feels like, so, right. um, yeah, that, that, the, there's definitely going to be some elbows out to kind of settle it. And it's not easy to break through because there's actually like good experience back for throughout most of the secondary, like Tommy Hill really changed his story on what he's about in November. It felt like as far yeah. as how the fan base views him, I think the staff was already trending that way. Um, but he feels like one of your corners. Right. And then, um, you know, Bly Hill, um, you know, it was a pickup portal pickup from the FCS who only played one year of college ball, but I think they really like, otherwise they would have brought him in. Um, and then of course at safety, um, you know, you have Buford back Singleton when he is healthy. Uh, we really liked what we saw out of him and Isaac Gifford. So, um, there's not a lot of space open on the top line necessarily. Um, however, it's going to be a very good fight to see like who's sort of either getting on the field as a starter or even a second teamer um, positioning themselves to be the guy in the years ahead. Yeah. We, we were kind of talking through before we start, before we push record. Um, and, and you mentioned one guy and there's another guy that's in my head is kind of like the same person in some ways. Like we saw Kai Wallen, the junior college transfer in the first what, four or five games. And then he decided that he was going to redshirt. I think he, he needs to add weight for what they were asking him to do. I think he got pushed around a little bit but got some experience, which I think is a good thing. Um, and then James Williams, we, yeah. we saw him come on later, really flash. And then they decided to go ahead and redshirt him and preserve that year, which I think was the right decision. Mm -hmm. But I think when people are kind of talking about, you know, the, the defensive line, what it is, what the, what the, how the depth kind of shakes out like wall and kind of, gets forgotten a little bit because he played so early in the season and then when was just kind of gone um you know Williams to me those two are really interesting and I'm eager to see if they kind of were able to make a jump in the spring given the experience that they had um obviously Williams I think is a really dynamic pass rusher can they get him to a point where he's more than just a third down edge is is the biggest question in my mind I mean I think he he knew coming in that he was going to have to add weight. Uh, his nickname is Sticks for a reason. He's a really rangy guy, um, but bends incredibly well, can get around the corner on on tackles and get after the quarterback. And really, you know, in, in that stretch of games in the middle of the season where Nebraska was playing pretty well, I mean, he really kind of changed what Nebraska was able to do on third down, and there really wasn't any kind of – you know, secret sauce to what was going on there with Tony White and the defense. Like they, they just gave him an opportunity and he ran with it. Mm -hmm. And I'm eager to kind of see what that looks like with more regularity on the field. And if he could be out there on, you know, second and four rather than just having to be a third and long pass rusher. <clears throat> yeah. The challenge for him and this, this happened to some guys is it's like, okay, your first assignment is you get like seven to 10 plays and go 250 miles an hour on those plays. That's what we're going to ask of you. You know that going in, everybody's on board with that. And then to take that from, okay, now you're going to have to give us, you know, you start working yourself into that 30 to 40 play range or something like that this next season. I don't know how it'll shake out, but um, it's a, a little bit like the reverse Nash, you know, like Nash had to do that a little bit last year from a different angle of um you know proving that he was more than just like okay you're out there for um run oriented plays only you we're going to keep you on the field when it's pass rushing all the stuff like we we believe that you're that type of versatile player james williams has to do sort of the opposite of of what nash had to do so um you you've actually interviewed him more than i have because he's um i tend to be up up by the podium and you you handle our our guys off to the side um and so, you know, his personality a little bit, but he seems like kind of a, uh, a lively sort, um, you know, interesting quote, just a guy who's, who's ready to attack it. And he, he, he bet on himself to come here and, and now he, you know, I, I'm not going to bet against him at this point from what we saw. Yeah, no, I think he, he's brutally honest. Um, that's what it is. Yeah. I mean, it, it it's, 
it's refreshing. I mean, I, I don't think you ever kind of are left wondering what he's thinking about things. And I, I, you know, he's pretty self-critical, I think, at times about the way he played last year. But I think with the understanding, too, of like, okay, I was on the scout team and two weeks later, I'm in there in crunch time, like trying to get after the quarterback. Um, You know, and I I think I think he's representative, though, of kind of what Nebraska sees as a potential advantage that they can have other over other programs. Because if you remember, he was part of that post-grad camp that they had. He came in from yeah. Juco, worked out, um, basically was extended an opportunity that day, accepted it, and was back in Lincoln two weeks later. And as a, as we kind of get into – this is a side tangent, I guess, but as we get into more of the summer months and we start talking about camps and things like that in June, I'm very eager to see if Nebraska is able to use James Williams' situation last year as a little bit of a carrot to go to mm-hmm. – junior college prospects who are qualifiers who can get on campus right away and say, look, come work out. This is what happens. If you impress us, I mean, you you could find yourself in Nebraska's locker room a month later. So I, I, I think that bears watching in June, if they're able to kind of uncover a few more James Williams, because I mean, in all honesty, I mean, if, if James Williams hadn't have committed to Nebraska last summer i mean i I think his his recruitment was kind of poised to blow up he was already getting on sec programs radars Mm -hmm. last year so that that that's something to watch but i i think you know what he kind of is coming out of having a full winter conditioning um you know with with the program because he really didn't even get that last summer just based on when he arrived Uh, I'm, i'm kind of eager to see what that picture looks like I like that side tangent you took. That's like we we went down a little alleyway and we discovered there's a little bodega down there and it, it was nice, you know, a yeah. little place you can sit outside and enjoy a beverage. Yeah. Yeah. That was good. Who else you got? There were a couple other names that you mentioned that I frankly had kind of forgotten were even there. <laughs> oh. Um in particular linebacker. Um you mentioned Dylan Rogers and his his name has come up a few times. Just you know, in passing, but what's the opportunity for him given that he's at a spot where it seems like there's a little bit of depth lacking going into the spring? Yeah. Most importantly, it's rule who uh, has brought him up a few times um, just here or there. Um, He'll unsolicited mention his name Um, at least, you know, last, last fall or last winter, he would say him. Um, yeah, he was in the last recruiting class. And I think if you look at the linebacker situation, minus, uh, Reimer and Henrich, it's sort of a new era there. Obviously John Bullock coming back is huge, um, from how many snaps he gave and, and just how he progressed as a player. Um, but I think anybody, whether you're Dylan Rogers or, um, like Vincent Shavers or Willis McGay, who gay, he who's enrolled early has to be thinking, there's an open door here for me to crack the two deep. If I, if I show everything I'm about, you know, whether that's starting or not, I don't know, but there's definitely opportunity there. And so, yeah, Rogers is one to um, not forget about. And I feel like he's a name that sometimes people glossed over when he was recruited. He kind of had a quiet recruitment. Um, He just, you know, made his announcement. And then, um, you know, maybe once or twice you'd hear like, Oh, is it everything on board with him, you know, coming to Nebraska, but it wasn't one of those that people um, just tracked for months and months or thought about a lot. And I think because of that, that's maybe translated to because he redshirted, we're not talking about him as much now, but all that matters is the head coach brings him up some. And so we'll see what that means in the spring, but he's definitely someone to at least keep in mind as is, you know, Maverick Noonan, um, who I guess what you classify him as more of an edge, um, you he know, was, pretty he jack. Was like a jack spot, I think a little be bit. A jack. Yeah, he was a jack. Um, but he had the injury in fall camp and the uh, last press conference rule said he'll, he might be out there in the spring. He might have a shot he, or at least he didn't rule him out. So, um, Maverick Noonan, it seemed like was doing uh pretty well, um, you know, since he got here prior to the injury. So he's another one to just not forget about. 
I, I only had one more on my list, and, and you can fill in behind me if, if you think of anybody else. Um, Sua Lafotu mm-hmm. was – he got in – early a few games he he was actually right up on the four game i think where they were kind of having to decide if he was going to be a depth piece or not um he recovered a fumble late against colorado that that was the they recovered the fumble and i think heinrich carberg let him on a scoring drive if, if i remember correctly um but you know he was a little bit overshadowed by by riley van poppel but i think he's a guy that long term they like what he can be as as kind of an interior push the pile kind of guy. I, I I guess coming into last season, I really didn't expect him to be out there a ton, especially given kind of what they had depth wise, the defensive line spot. But I mean, he's a guy that I, I think will benefit from having played the, the little bit that he did. You have a full off season uh, to kind of get up to speed with strength and conditioning, which I think benefits linemen a lot more. Uh, than other spots too, but um, you know, I, I think he's a guy that that maybe kind of gets overshadowed a bit in that rotation as well. I mean, I, I I remember reading some of the conversation during this last recruiting cycle was, you know, Nebraska seemed to be a little bit light on some of the defensive linemen that they were targeting and taking, but I think he's an important piece of kind of that youth movement that's going to be next in line behind Hup, Hutmaker and Robinson and those guys to add along the defensive line. Yeah. I think the key to being a really good program is you've got to have guys like him sort of like we can go back to Nash again, where in that third or fourth year at that position, it's in the spring, you start to hear like, okay, this guy's coming on now. And you, you, the coach kind of says, says it in that tone, you know, or whatever. It's like, all right, pay attention seriously about this guy. He might, he might have a shot. Like a guy like LaFoto doesn't have to necessarily bust out even this year to me, but you want to just hear like that. He's tracking. Well, he, he gets some snaps out there and then he's building toward like, yeah, the next spring, even you're like, okay, he's, he's, he's like next now, you know, you got to have those guys in the trenches who are just next. And maybe for two years, you don't hear about them. This could lead us into the old line discussion too. Cause there's a bunch of red shirts there. Um, you know, there's a bunch of guys on the old line who, if you look at the situation, maybe it's not their time quite yet. Maybe they're a year away. But if you're hearing that like Sam Sledge or Gunnar Gatula is like challenging for a two deep spot and he's like seventh or eighth in the rotation, that's a good sign to me. You know, like if those guys are in that position this year, when you look at the experience coming back. So I think kind of the same about LaFoto as some of those old linemen, if he can kind of position himself where he's not the first guy you think about, but you haven't forgotten about him and you know that his time's around the corner. Um, that's where Nebraska has to just keep that wheel spinning constantly um, on both sides to be, to be what they want to be. Yeah. Well, and, and last year's class was actually pretty big line wise. I mean, you had Machachok that was added late. He's on defense now, I guess. Mason mm-hmm. Goldman uh, had some off season surgery, but he's, you know, a, a lineman there. You mentioned Gatula, Brock Knudsen on the offensive line, uh, Sledge as well. I mean, I I think I think the class they took. I mean, it was a lot of it was with the eye of like these are developmental guys that we see have high upside, and you know in some cases, I mean, it's a good sign that you have guys like Sam Sledge that are that are a little bit kind of ahead of the curve, and. You know, I, I don't know that he necessarily emerges as a starting guard this year, but I think he's going to be in that conversation with some veteran guys, which is what you like to see. I mean, I, I think your point's right. I mean, by year three or year four, you need to be hearing from those guys in some major way. Uh, you also kind of like it when, you know, a guy's coming off a redshirt year and he's at least, you know, showing that he's going to be in the mix a little bit more than what you'd expect at that point already. Mm-hmm. Gatula would be – uh a tackle option, I would think, um, cool. if if I'm remembering right. And obviously, you know, you're hoping this year uh, you got a, a big deal with Ben Hart coming back for one more season and then um, Prohaska maybe taking off. Corcoran situation's up in the air with that injury. It seems like it's going to drift into the fall camp at least. Um, so wherever they were going to put Corcoran, that's one veteran who's not like right out there right now where somebody's got to, uh, step up. 
Um, obviously, Ben Scott being back and, and Micah Mazuka got challenged a little bit in one of the press conferences, but he's he's played a lot of college football. So there there is a lot of veterans in that group now. Um, but there's definitely space for like two or three guys who are younger to be like knocking on the door if they're not even inside the house yet. So um, Sledge has definitely seemed like a name that has come up here and there where keep keep him on the radar. Yeah. Anybody else we didn't hit on yet? I, I That was most of my list. Yeah, we went through uh, most of uh, – I mean, there's all sort of, – it's, it's really fascinating because the fun thing is, like, you know, Ramir Stewart's on there. Ethan Nation actually went uh, – did not redshirt technically you know ishmael smith flores is a guy you, you keep in mind vincent carroll jackson um so so there's all sorts of guys from that class um to, to that maybe we'll hear from two weeks into spring you know um Jaden doss uh ended up red shirting he played in four games i think it was one of the most valuable things i, I don't mean this as a slight it's the way I started it seemed is going to seem like that, but Billy Kemp was, I think pretty hobbled at the end of the year and he played through it. And because he did, um, they were very limited with their options at receiver by the last couple of games, but they wanted to keep that red shirt on DOS. And it was a huge thing that Kemp was able to battle through. And some of those guys could play at the end to keep, uh, keep that for DOS because I think, he would have no doubt burned his red shirt had he not suffered the arm injury or hand injury um, in fall camp. He was probably tracking as well the, from what we had gathered of any mm-hmm. of those freshman receivers heading into the season. And then he had the injury. So Jaden Doss should very much be someone people are thinking about this season. You want to take a quick break, get some, get some orange slices and uh, we'll yeah. come back and talk wind totals and a little bit of Husker baseball. Sound good? Yeah, I'll get, I'll get a Capri Sun too and I'll, I'll be ready. All right. We'll be right back. All right. All right. Welcome back. Hey, 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 hey. I thought you were drinking your Capri Sun. You can have it. You, you know, you, I'll have my Capri Sun. You can take the, take the mic. So it's February. So that's, it's, what is that off season wind total season? Is that where we're at? Um, it's one of the things we're at. That and like the big opinions on non-conference scheduling sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that that's the spot in the calendar that we are. FanDuel came out with their their number for Nebraska: seven and a half wins. Brian Christopherson, right now, are you taking the over or under? Um, I'm taking the under barely. I think I have them at seven. But I, I'm I, the last couple of years. I think people would say all oh, these guys, that's guys a homer over here and all this stuff. But if they, my picks, the last couple of years of Nebraska's win total have not been that favorable. Actually, I've kind of been right at that like five, six, six win territory. But I think this year I'm, I might go bold and I might work my way to eight even by the by the time this season. But right now I would say seven. So it's a good, uh, it's a good number they have. So we're driving back from Indianapolis at the end of July. The <laughs> the high of getting ready to start covering fall camp is upon us, and you're going to be talking yourself into eight and nine wins. You're going to get to nine? Oh, I don't know about that. I could definitely see eight, though, and the reason why I'm not going to apologize for this is um, I like what the way they're building it. I do. I, I, I like the moves they made at quarterback. I know there's going to be growing pains that go with that position. But I also don't think they can go. I don't think they can do this. B minus seventeen or whatever in turnovers <laughs> again. Like I just don't think that can happen. Maybe Brian, it, it can and it may. It, 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 there's no floor. So I I always think to myself, it's like, well, yeah, maybe the schedule's a little bit harder this year. I don't know though. Like I I'm not convinced this is just like a, a ball busting schedule. I really am not especially when you look at the front half of it. There's a lot you can get done early on in this season if you've got your crap together. It's uh, for as as much as everybody was saying, and I don't know if we were guilty of this. We might have been. Probably. But probably. 
but but with the dissolving of the Big Ten West, the assumption was that was that last year was Nebraska's last chance to get them, and that and that was it. And and after that, the ceiling is six wins. You're banished into just being lucky to play in the Sun Bowl or whatever you know bowl tie-in they're going to have at that point. But it with the way things played out last year. And, and just kind of looking at the way that some of the teams finished and some of the offseason moves that have taken place, not only in portal in, in the portal, but also coaching. That schedule in 24 does not seem as daunting as it did probably uh, at the start of last season. Is that fair? Like, I, I, I think the early the early season portion of the schedule to me was always like, oh, you got to get four or five right out of the gates or else you're screwed. The, the back half of the schedule seems like Nebraska, it doesn't seem as dire, I guess, as maybe what I had seen previously. Like, I'm talking myself into this that, like, yeah, they got a shot. Well, we could just go with the back. You can make a whole discussion. I even threw a thread up about it, like, call your shot on November today, like the four games in November. And the schedule there, which you were getting into with that comment, is – UCLA and Lincoln to start November, um, obviously just underwent a coaching change and is sort of figuring it out with Deshaun Foster. Um, then they're at USC. I get it. That's a tough, tough game, but USC has got to prove some things too. Um, so I don't think you, I mean, I, I would favor USC. Yes, but I don't think you just say like, Hey, you can't go there and, and give them a fight or, or make that really interesting. Um, then they have, Wisconsin um, in Lincoln and then at Iowa. That schedule does not make me quake in my boots. It's a challenge for a team. This is, we're talking about a program that hasn't been to a bowl game. So everything is ba- since 2016. So everything is based off of that. I get it. But I'm just saying that it's not like Nebraska isn't pretty close to what Wisconsin is right now. And I know. You know, you're not supposed to say that out loud. Nebraska should have won that game in Madison last year. They should have. And if they would have won that game, they didn't. But if they would have, we would say they're in the exact same spot, basically. Instead, they let Wisconsin off the hook. It's something Nebraska has been very good at um, for several years is letting teams. It's been one of my biggest uh, beefs with the Husker program, Bruns. It's not only how they've hurt themselves, but they've lifted up flex program they've lifted up the badgers at times when they were ready to kind of face face plant and uh, this needs to be the year you stop letting some of those teams off the hook um who are trending in a dangerous territory and oh they pulled out a win over you and now their season saved and all that and wisconsin did sort of save their season after that by the way but anyway all that was another tangent that i went on to say i don't think the schedule in november is just Scary, scary, no. Because you have you, you go to Ohio State the last weekend of October. You have a buy. There's a buy mixed in there between UCLA and USC, right? I believe. Uh, yes, I believe so. So, yeah, I mean, I think you can get a little bit done there. And if, I mean, that that's going to be, I think, a little bit of a test, too, of kind of a proof of concept of the way that Nebraska wants to do things, right? They want to be a team that plays better in November than, you know, that they, 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 they want to be on an upward trend going into November. They were this year. They didn't get it done in November. Um, and, and, you know, that that's kind of the, the sense of urgency or has created more of a sense of urgency, I think, in the program going into year two is, is how do you take that next step and, and close some of those things out when you have the chance. And I, I agree. I mean, I, I think USC on the road is going to be a very tough game, but I, I don't, I don't see that as like walking into Ann Arbor in November, like you've done the last couple of years. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, I, I, I think that's kind of the difference in my mind. It's seven and a half still feels a bit high. I'm kind of like you. I could talk myself into, you know, if if, if things happen, you know, with other programs, depending on you know what comes out of the spring, I could maybe talk myself into it, but. I think seven and five is probably where I land right now with a, with still a lot of that work having to come early in the year. Here's why that's a good number that they set, though. Um, 
they're looking at it from the vantage point of yes, the schedule. They're also looking at Nebraska's metrics last year, probably with some of the turnovers and stuff. And they're saying, no, that couldn't, they, they, they got to bring that down a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I think if you look at how it sets up, we'll, we always work our way into writing these type of stories in the long off season, but from September 21st to October 19th, Nebraska has a four game stretch that will be key into settling if they are, you know, an eight win kind of team. That's where they play Illinois at Purdue. Then they host Rutgers who had a very solid season last year at Indiana with their new coach. To me, if Nebraska were to go, let's say like three and one over that stretch, um, that puts them in possible position for, to, to crack even that seven and a half. Like if you go three and one there and you handle your two non-con games, obviously a big swing will be if you beat Colorado or not, that's going to be huge in settling this kind of debate. Um, but if you did beat Colorado and you went three and one um, in those games I talked about, you would ideally have um, six wins um, at least going into the, the November stretch run. So six wins um, would give you a good shot to, to get over the hump there. So that middle stretch will be huge, you know, um, which Nebraska actually did really well in that stretch last year. And then they just didn't take advantage of it to finish. We're spending a lot of time in Indiana this fall, aren't we? Um, Let's see that. Yeah, you're right. We are. (laughs) We're at, we're at Purdue. Purdue Pete's going to, host us for a lasagna dinner on Friday night and then they play Saturday, September 28th at Purdue. And then they play at Indiana on October 19th. Um, so yeah. Over, over at Mellon camps place. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't want to share your opinion on Mellon camp. Cause no. maybe that gets you in trouble. We'll move on. Yeah. Uh, so w- lastly, we'll, we'll run through this real quick. Nebraska baseball opens their season last weekend in Arlington, Texas. They go one and two. Um, they they beat Baylor in the opener and then lose a couple nine inning, uh, lose a couple of games in the ninth to Texas Tech, ranked Texas Tech and Oklahoma. Um, I don't know how much you followed along or saw things or heard things, but just kind of my takeaway from the weekend. I, it felt like Nebraska played better than one and two. And, you know, that, that was a higher level of competition than Nebraska, than Nebraska typically faces right out of the gates. They saw better pitching than they probably see right out of the gates. Um, and I, I think they, th- there were things that you could take away from that that were pretty promising for the direction of the season. I mean, I, I think, you know, there's, there's room to grow offensively. I think the they the strikeout numbers were a little bit too high um, on offense, but they they stuck in and battled. They had some good at bats there. Um, you know, I, I think on a three game weekend, you feel okay about what you've got pitching wise, and it's just a matter of figuring out kind of your your order of things in the bullpen. But I I, I didn't leave that weekend feeling like Nebraska is in a significant amount of trouble this year. Like I, I think it's a team that has some pieces. It's just a matter of kind of figuring out how the puzzle kind of fits together to make that, that final picture. Yeah. Um, I followed it from afar as Bill Callahan once said about the Nebraska Kansas state, uh, football quote unquote rivalry that he followed from afar. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was disappointing the Oklahoma one then the ninth. I was, I was tracking it on our board as you were updating it. And uh, you get you delivered the bad news to me that the ninth inning had gotten away from the yeah. boys. Um, and that's too bad because it felt like kind of piggybacking off what you said. They had played ball good enough to be two and one. And that would have been really nice. Um, so there's that part where there's some of the fan base, especially if they're not like as baseball centric, you kind of treat games sort of like you do football where losses hurt more than they maybe are. They would they're not as weighted in baseball when the season's a little longer. Um, However, I do understand people are kind of like, they want to see the Huskers sort of close out those sort of games that they feel like have gotten away the last couple of years. 
Um, but all in all, I thought it was a promising, like big picture weekend as far as what they have on the roster and what could happen if guys develop as they should. So I, I, I left uh, probably more encouraged than the other. Yeah. It, and I think that's an important thing. I mean, you usually got to give it like three, four weeks into the season before you get a little hot takey on things. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, we'll see how they do. They, they, they play two four game series over the next couple weekends. They're at grand Canyon, um, this weekend down in Arizona and then Charleston Southern, uh, for four games next weekend. And then that's it for non, for the, the opening non-conference play. They'll probably, probably be playing in like 40 degree temperatures at Haymarket park when they come back, uh, per usual. But, uh, Lastly, just a little piece of news with Husker baseball, Joshua Overbeek, the starting third baseman who came out of last weekend as Nebraska's leading hitter average wise, uh, broke a bone in the tip of his throwing hand Mm. and is going to be out for about three weeks. So you'll see a little bit different, a couple different faces at third base, maybe Rhett Stokes, uh, Dylan Huff, both junior college transfers will probably get a shot there. Uh, but they'll have to figure that out. And then with the four-game series, Drew Christo slides in to start on Thursday against Grand Canyon. So we'll have all the coverage of that at Husker 24-7. Is there anything else that we have to hit on, Brian? And then you can get us out of here. Does Grand Canyon have a deep lineup? They got some dudes. Um, they 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 got some guys that can pitch it. They started 3-0. and I think they beat Ohio State last night. Oh, so, okay. Um little little big 10 uh setback there but dan marley used to be the head basketball coach at grand canyon that's that's about all i know thunder dan. thunder dan yeah. yeah that's our era that's our yeah. era who back when the nba was fantastic yeah i went on a little all-star game rant the other day on one of our husker mashes so i'll, I'll leave it there um not be total old guy about it and, and continue the conversation. But uh, no, I think we got a lot done in this one. Uh, hit on a variety of subjects and uh, should we uh, lock it up? Yeah, get us out of here. All right. Well, thanks for joining us for this podcast, but you can also uh, come back to the Husker 24 seven site. We've got everything going right now with obviously the chase uh, to be in March madness for the basketball programs, um, football recruiting, the, the lead in to spring ball, um, baseball, with Bruns given all the updates there. So whatever your Husker news is, we'll have it come to Husker 24 seven for all the latest.